no one asked me to be, to express everything that I was feeling in that moment. They just wanted to be there with us and do life. And that's how you are a friend and how you are there for other people. You do life with them. You're listening to Shall We Unpack This? with your host, Leilani Carrasco. Hey everyone, welcome back to the SWAT podcast. If you joined us last week, my friend Becca was on the show to talk about her experience in losing a twin mid-pregnancy and how it was like to hold grief and joy in the same hands and also how to walk through this loss of how you imagine pregnancy being, all the experiences that seem so idyllic that don't always happen. I think that's so helpful for especially other women out there that are like, yeah, that I didn't get that wish either, and it really sucked. And it's, it's helpful to see somebody else go through that and know, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one struggling with that feeling. So today, I really appreciate Becca's insight on how to approach a friend or show love to someone who is going through a really rough time. We've all been there. We've all gone through grief or turmoil, and we know what we'd like to have said to us. Maybe we don't even know what we want said to us or how we want to be comforted. It's, it's, it's such a, a chaotic time. But it can feel almost like a gauntlet to walk through of, I want to help. I want to say something encouraging, but what do I say? Will I'm sorry be enough? Will uh, this covered dish be enough? Oh gosh, you know, it can, it can feel like a lot of pressure that is unspoken. So I'm really thankful for Becca's insight that she shares today. Uh, uh, just a good reminder of, here is how to love on friends that are going through a hard time. So let's get to the interview. So now we've we've learned that one of the twins didn't make it. And now we have another life to see to the end. Mm -hmm. When was her due date? Her due date was August 11th. Okay. Um, she was born June 4th. <laughs> Two months early. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh so uh, about a month before she was born, I was put on bed rest again. Um, and they said, you have some options because she's not growing. There's various options, various levels of this that we can do. You can take some medicine. Mm -hmm. um, this particular medicine is a common medicine for some people, men particularly. Oh. Um, Viagra. Oh. Yeah. Um, because it's actually a blood pressure, it was developed as a blood pressure medicine. Oh, that's right. That just yeah. had the effect. Um, and it would, so basically the thing, its main goal was to push more blood down there to help her grow. Okay. But yeah, I got some real, real, really weird looks. Um, the pharmacist asked me, <laughs> why do you need this? <laughs> and I said, because my doctor prescribed it for me. <laughs> At this point, we knew because I had another condition called vasoprevia, where the blood vessels connecting the um, umbilical cord and the placenta were in front of my cervix. So if I went into um, labor, then it would cut those and she wouldn't. Like the contractions would cut those. Ooh. So the goal was before I go into labor, we're going to have this baby. And I had to have a C-section. Okay. So, so once again, you're kind of prepped. Yes. For this worst I'm, case scenario again. Now, yeah. So uh -huh. 32 weeks, I think, was the longest we were going to go at that point. So that was kind of. It was always going to be early. Yeah. We always knew it was going to be early. Um, we were counting the weeks um, okay. at this point. Um, when we hit 24 weeks. We were extremely excited. 24 weeks is the point of viability. Yeah. So, like, we're counting the weeks every week. Um, we're going to either 
we're either yeah. going to my normal doctor or the high risk doctor, like on alternating weeks at this point. The weekend before she was born, I felt really weird. Mm-hmm. Couldn't put a pin on it. I felt really weird. Um, I was like, it's not nauseous. It's not dizzy. It's not. I just feel really off, really weird. So Monday we had an appointment with my doctor, just the normal checkup. And um, when you're pregnant, every time you go to the doctor, you have to pee in a cup. And they check all your, uh, your yeah. levels and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And so she came in after I done that and they'd done their little test and she said we're gonna send you upstairs you're showing some slightly high levels and um you're, you're showing a little bit of preeclampsia so we're gonna just we're just gonna send you upstairs um and just check and see and then um the doctor's gonna call the high-risk doctor and they're gonna kind of confer and decide what's happening they're going to do tests to see if you're actually preclinic and and then decide what they want to do mm-hmm. so we went upstairs to the um maternity floor and sitting in the little room and there for a while um and then the doctor comes in and says we're gonna have a baby tomorrow oh god um, ah! she just pops she just goes how's it going um we're gonna have a baby tomorrow Okay. Yeah, so they oh. they lay me down and everything, and I'm awake the whole time. Josh is sitting up there with me, and the anesthesiologist is up there. So we're up there having a conversation. They're trying to distract me and everything yeah. from what's happening. Huh. Um, and then she was born. And she was born at 30 weeks. She was um, two pounds, four ounces. Um, and she... Could not control her temperature, so she had a little bag, and she had her little tin hat, and um, just a little sat on her little head, about like that, <laughs> until they could get her cap. to until they got her to her isolate. Okay. Um, and then I don't have the bag, um, but she had the bag. She yeah, it's so funny. She looks like she's in one of those slow cooker line, you know, like the the, <laughs> like the crock, pot crock pot liners, or like a turkey bag. Like you just put the kid in the turkey bag. <laughs> You know, I mean, essentially, I mean, how does a, a little thin layer of plastic keep them warm? Or was it like super special plastic? I don't really know oh, much about it, but yeah. yeah, they got her all situated. Um, Josh went over, cut the umbilical cord, and then they brought her over to me when she was all bundled up. Mm-hmm. And I got to give her a little kiss on the head and yeah. um, tell her well, I loved her. And then yeah. off they took her to the NICU. That's got to be a bizarre feeling like that moment of you know the baby on your chest or getting to touch her yeah i guess you were just probably relieved that she was out but mm-hmm. it was like well, okay mm-hmm. well i guess goodbye yeah. you know how was that we feeling? heard her cry um oh. and it did sound it made me sound really it felt really weird to hear because she was so early yeah. um that she her cry wasn't or those those kind of court vocal cords weren't yeah. quite developed yet and she sounded like a little baby goat <laughs> A baby goat. <laughs> baby goat. That was the best way, of, like a yeah. lamb or a baby goat. Is yeah, what it sounded that. like. Yeah. Um, oh. So I was honestly trying not to laugh every time she. <laughs> You're like, what is this? And then this is like the craziest thing. Like yeah. this, this little diaper. Yes. Like what? Yeah. Um, and then this is her little. And little this was taken foot. right as she was born. Mm-hmm. Right? So like yeah, a thumb, a thumb's length. So yeah. we'll bring it closer to the, yeah. the the lights glinting off of it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So a so thumb. Yeah. After that, we, I'm in the room. They they got me back to the room. Got all my innards back in and oh, back God. to the room. <laughs> um, right. And Josh is going from me to the NICU back and forth to check on her. This is over a span of a few hours. Um, and um then the the NICU doctor comes in and he said we trying to put her IV in and um they like to put the IV into their umbilical cord Mm -hmm. um and typically umbilical cords are have three vessels in them um and so they can they that gives them two chances 
Emily only had one. Or, or mm. only had two vessels. Okay. So they only had one chance to really once one vein that they could get it into. Yeah. Um and they couldn't they couldn't get it. Mm-hmm. Um and so they said we she's gonna have to have what's called a pick line put in. Mm-hmm. Um and those are very, very specialized to put a pick line in. And there's no one in Abilene that can do it. Mm-hmm. Um at Cook Children's in Fort Worth, they have a team that is all they do is put in pick lines. Wow. Every day. That's all they do. Wow. Um and so they said we're gonna we're gonna send her there. And the helicopter is coming and <laughs> you're gonna, like Cool. <laughs> what a, at this point, bring on a helicopter, a yeah. boat. So she got a anything. little helicopter ride. Oh my god. Um, she and her dad like their helicopter rides when they're born, apparently. Oh yes, because yeah. Josh, Josh was, was care flighted as well. Josh right? was as well. He had some underdeveloped lungs when he was born. Oh. He was born at thirty-seven weeks, so basically full term. And so the plan in the end was, Josh and his parents were going to go to Fort Worth. My parents were going to stay with me. My sister was going to stay in the hospital with me. Okay. I was trying to pump and do all the things to help um, because um, it's really beneficial for babies in the NICU to have um, breast milk. Um, and so... Even, and just enter it intravenously. Um, they, so they give it in a tube. They, they are tube fed. Tube fed. The yeah. Okay. She, she was tube yeah. fed to start yeah. out with. And so you're trying to pump, did anything? I mean, not much. Wow. I mean, in the whole time that she was in the NICU, which was 71 days, I think I would, at, at the most I could get out was maybe one bottle that she could have. And she could only have, like, I mean, it was in the ounces we were talking, like, not very much, like, yeah. that I could get out. Um, it was just too early. Yeah. She was just born too early. Things weren't ready in my body for yeah. all of that. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that's pretty common. Yeah, I would um, think so. Being able to breastfeed is just like giving having a very normal, like not uneventful pregnancy is also extremely, it's hard. It's really, it's why there are lactation consultants that yeah. are out there. And I met with the one at Cook's, like, at least once a week or two wow. for a while. Um, it's really hard. Um, I talked with my mom about it, and she struggled with Oh, she did. Of, mm-hmm. So I think that's really important to hear for other women because I was in my 20s, and I had a friend at the time. We're all so young, and again, I'm just taking all of this process for granted. Like, you just pop them out, no problem, and you just feed them, no problem, right? Yeah. But she felt so frustrated that she couldn't feed her baby enough and he was on the lower end of the Mm -hmm. you know percentile that feeling of like I can't if I didn't have any of this I wouldn't be able to feed my baby like Mm -hmm. that's got to be such a mind fuck Mm -hmm. I for me I never really wanted to breastfeed Mm. I never really had a desire I don't know if it was like just like the hormones or everything or the whole situation that kind of like made me feel like, okay, I need to do this. I can do this. I think I can, yeah. you know, maybe this is really good. Um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, there is a lot of research that breast milk is best, but, um, NICUs, um, especially like, I, I don't know about Bolt and others, but where she was at Cook's, they have, um, a breast milk bank and people donate their breast milk. So she was supplemented with breast milk. Wow. Um, up until we made the decision to just stop trying. And I was up, I was pumping every four hours. From the time that we found out she was gonna go to Cook's Mm -hmm. until the time that she left, they put what is called a lovey, it's those little like doll heads with the um, blankets on them. Okay. Um, They put one in her isolate with her and then they put one I laid with one. And so um, when she got all ready to go, they took mine and gave it to her oh. and hers and gave it to me. And so I had her smell oh. to maybe help yeah. with kind of, kind of 
induce those hormones and all of wow. that chemical balance that says, okay, let's produce milk. From the smell, the mm -hmm. scent of your baby. Mm -hmm. And you had and mentioned she had my smell to help her want to calm want. down. Oh. Not just so like, it does a lot for her to have my smell because she's had my smell the whole time being inside of me. Wow. They're very sensitive to your smell and heartbeat and stuff like that because that's all they know and have experienced yeah. for so, the last however many months. So with the NICU, you had mentioned something about like there was this like window of, okay, I can't bond with my baby, but that's so essential for mm -hmm. their wellness. Mm -hmm. um, how did you, how do they balance that with like getting you to have time with her? So yeah. I was in the hospital she was born on Tuesday and she left here Tuesday evening, like around 10 or 11. Um, and she was, she was in the hospital at Cook's by midnight. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't leave the hospital until Thursday morning. Were you going for bonkers or were um, you like, whatever, you know, I was still in that very like focus, like okay. make sure she's okay for okay. the first like day. Okay. Um, and all of that, it wasn't until, Sometime in the next day, they had removed my Mac bag and moved me from maternity, from the maternity ward to mother baby. Mm -hmm. And then also Josh had gotten to the hospital um, to, to Cook's and he had gotten, he'd sent me pictures of him. He got to hold her and do what's called kangaroo time. And so basically it's skin to skin. Mm -hmm. He got a um, recording of her crying. Yeah. That was also to help me yeah. kind of yeah. Maybe, let down. Yeah, maybe. let down and um, see if that would happen. When it finished, I, I just started, I had not cried the whole time mm -hmm. since they stuck me with the needle oh, until yeah. this point. Yeah. And I just cried. It was the first point where I allowed myself to miss her because mm -hmm. I was just trying, like, like, I know this can be really hard for me. Like, I know this is a hard time. Like, I'm, my goal is to do everything I can to get to the point where I can be with her. And so, like, I was just very, uh, was making myself focus on that rather than miss her and miss Josh and be mm -hmm. upset yeah. that I don't get to be with my husband yeah. because my baby's sick. Like I'm like trying to balance these feelings of anger and jealousy yeah. and sadness that yeah. things aren't perfect when we're not guaranteed perfect. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like knowing that there is a goal. I know I'm going to get to see her. Like a lot of times these moms that their babies are all of a sudden taken to the NICU. They may not know when things are going to happen. And I know I went through a really big situation. It was really hard. But I also know that my child's health was never in extreme danger. Yeah. Yeah, like that would be. She was she was small and she was really early. Yeah, that was all. It, uh, that yeah. that was it. Yeah. We were in some terrifying situations because we were in situations that not many people you know have gone through. And, you know, Josh's parents had to deal with Nikki with him, and mm -hmm. I couldn't think of a better scenario for him to be in. Yeah. And for me, like I never worried about him the whole time. Mm -hmm. that he was gone like when they said she's going to the NICU and he was getting ready to leave he said are you sure you're gonna be okay I said I've taken care of her mm -hmm. for the last few months mm -hmm. your turn your dad now I've yeah. been mom yeah your dad now yeah and and he and I knew that he had the people that could support him and knew what he was going through yeah more than anybody else Absolutely. in the world what an amazing setup in a way you know and that's that, that's so unique too because it does seem like uh, it's all the mom's work and the dad's kind of just floating around like what do I do? There's a you look. Know. 
Mm-hmm. There's a look. Um, it, was you know, it just like a look of focus, distraught? Um, terror. Terror. Absolute terror. Wow. There's so much unknown, and nobody plans to go to Cook's. It's your, your child was away from you a lot of the times because um, for us, uh, if they're in a helicopter ride, you can't ride with them. There's not enough space in the oh. helicopter. And then you're like, I'm going to send so, my baby up into the yeah. sky and nobody can even go with Yeah. Me. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, just the, ah. just the helicopter team is with them and they're really trained. That's yeah, what they do. Yeah. They're great. Yeah, it's just um, like, oh, my goodness. You don't know what to expect. Mm-hmm. And everybody's situation is different. The reason they're there is different, but it's always terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. You're just all of a sudden you're you're there. And it's always it always happens that. And so you made it there. Yeah. So I rode my Josh had ridden with his parents. They'd only taken one car mm-hmm. and they just got there. So mm-hmm. we got my car. My mom drove my car and I rode with my dad. And um and I just remember being like so overwhelmed by the whole thing when I'm very introverted and I haven't really been alone this whole time. So I'm like emotionally kind of, I'm really drained and tired and yeah, all of you that. You need a recharge. I needed a recharge and I hadn't had one in days. Oh, that was so, crazy. Yeah. Um, I'm... We get there, you know, and so there's there's my parents and Josh's parents and Josh and we gotta see, we gotta get up to the room and we gotta they got me a wheelchair and wheeled me up all the way up to the, the room and um it's it's just very overwhelming and a lot of things yeah. happening at once and I'm just like very quiet the whole time. But within uh an hour or so of being there, uh As soon as they could get me sitting in the chair and um, situated, uh, I was holding her. Oh, gosh. I bet that relief. There is a picture of me holding her for the first time. Um, And she is, I've got a tank top on and she's kind of tucked in right (laughs) here. Yeah. It's kind of, you have to like pause and look at it, but you can see this little like, glimmer on the top of her at my tear right there on her head oh because i had waited days and all i had gotten was they they put me in a wheelchair before she left and wheeled me to the NICU and i put my hand on her that's the last time i touched her oh my gosh um I, the last yeah. time i'd seen her they wheeled yeah. her in in the so when they, they life fight you've got a big it's a stretcher and then in the middle is this little box and it's got all the equipment on the sides and a little blue box, uh-huh. a little isolate in the middle. Yeah. And that's that's what they take them on, a big stretcher. Wow. Thing. Yeah. And they fight them like that. Yeah. Um, and so wow. she was, they had wheeled, they wheeled that in. We prayed with the our, all our family before, all our family and with the, um, the pilots mm-hmm. and crew. Aww. And then they took her. And then the next time I saw her, and she was finally on she was laying on me how so, long did you get to spend with her that finally when you got I, to night? i held her for an hour and then put her back um but her her heart rate all her vitals like dropped down to way more normal when she was on like her vitals were pretty good but they were a little mm-hmm. elevated and mm-hmm. stuff before and they would drop a little bit with Josh and um but when I held her they said she they're yeah way way better that's so powerful I mean I can only imagine or I think of my mom you know like talking about like after the baby is out it's like give me my baby you know kind of a thing and so this just this experience of oh no it'll be a few days you know what yeah yeah i always knew it would be a little bit yeah Um, that helps to be prepared mentally especially when i was put on the magnesium um i wouldn't be able to get out of bed for a whole uh it was 24 hours Mm -hmm. after so i kind of already always knew that that was kind of the thing and i think what what also contributed to my my breakdown is that is when I expected to be holding her. 
Yeah. Like, You're like, I prepared my mind up to this point. Yes. Not like, pee on. Like when I found out I was going to be on magnesium because of the preeclampsia, this is what I prepared my mind for. Mm-hmm. And now I have to wait now even further. More. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. so how did you guys, what was the advice or how were you directed as far as we're in this place, we're in this NICU, I got a husband, we have a marriage to work on. Yeah. Like, how did you balance all that while you're healing and the baby and all of this? Um, it was a bit of a journey, but the biggest advice we were given was to leave the hospital, get out of the hospital mm-hmm. and to not just sit in the hospital 24 seven. Yeah. And cause I mean, you, they are set up that you can, you at cooks, you could literally live just there, kind of live in that bubble in the hospital yeah. the whole time. And they highly discourage that mm-hmm. because it is a bubble. Mm-hmm. You're sitting there in this room day in and day out with the beeping, and the oh. noise and the crying from the other rooms and the ah, um yeah and cooks is a little more private than other hospitals um and everybody comes to you the lactation consultant came to me um they had me a pump in the room mm-hmm. before i even got there um josh texted me while i'm in the hospital he's like do you have a pump yet i said no and so they had one there that afternoon, like on Wednesday afternoon, and I didn't arrive till Thursday. Wow. Um, they, people come, they have activities that they do. We went to a few of those. I mean, you talk about stressful, like we had been apart, both stressing without the other person. Like literally that night we had a fight. Like there's so oh, much, um, you're just <laughs> both, we were both exhausted it's brittle and we're trying to get up <laughs> yeah. to the room and like you don't even know what you're arguing about mm-hmm. you're just all so tired it was like 11 o'clock that night when we finally got to our room yeah. and um we so it was it was really important that we got the Ronald mcdonald house instead of staying in the hospital room and so that was important um and we would go out to eat regularly um like the first week we were there then josh asked the nurse he said could you get us a list of great places to eat here and she went to all the other nurses and they made a list wrote Mm -hmm. it down for us of Mm -hmm. places to eat and i think we we went to every single one of those at some point multiple times we wanted to I mean, we're not on a vacation, but we knew we needed those types of things, Mm -hmm. things that make it not feel like you're in this terrifying place. Yeah. You're not in this bubble. Wow. Taking that intentional time and because I could, I I could see how it'd be easily like, I want to be devoted. I want to be all in and stay here. And again, that guilt of Mm -hmm. like, well, we're just going to gallivant around Fort Worth while our child is in this incubator you know I'm so glad that you took that time to just be humans Mm -hmm. be normal Mm -hmm. um again that word normal of just bringing it in you try to bring in as much normal life as you can Mm. Um, and that's a really great thing about the Ronald McDonald house so the way it's built you're basically living like a hotel room okay then downstairs they have a kitchen and there are so many things from that kitchen that I would love to have in my kitchen. <laughs> um, the biggest, the best thing that happened the whole time we were in the NICU, the best memory as far as how we felt community around us mm-hmm. is our life group at church drove mm-hmm. to Fort Worth, to the DFW area. One of the f- people in our life group, his family lived there mm-hmm. and they all stayed in that house, their kids and everything came with them. His family had a pool and um, we went out for the day and spent time with fam- with our chosen family that night. They had a Saturday night service and we went there together. And so we got to sit in church with our family that we go to church with every Sunday. Mm-hmm. 
when every week that we were there, we were going to a different church. And I love that experience. And I love yeah. getting to see yeah. that type of stuff. But when we got to go with those people yeah. that we get every day, yeah, that just like a sense of connectedness after it was the like, most connect it was the connection that we never like yeah knew we needed until they just they chose to drive wow two and a half hours to mm -hmm. spend a day with us yeah just because they cared about us yeah and they wanted to do the best they could do to show us they were there for us mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that much, because I think even though so many of us have gone through grief when it comes to what can we do, we all just kind of like hit a wall. Yeah. But for you to share that and just to show how much that meant, that sense of connectedness, mm -hmm. if anything, because you guys were gone like two and a half months. Yeah. They asked us, how's she doing? But they didn't, no one like really tried to like how are you oh how are you doing can you the, just the kind of serious yeah. like it was like we're just normal we get to yeah, be normal they said, how how are things how are you guys doing yeah how is she we didn't dwell there but then we just hung out yeah swam in the pool and hung out did and things. we're together just like it was normal and that was, you know, we had that in the back of our mind. I'm like doing the math of when I had to pump again, the whole nine yards, oh, you know? okay, okay. Um, and so there's all that like mental that's in the back. But regardless of where my head was at, like my heart was here with them in that moment. And, and no one asked me to be, to express everything that I was feeling in that moment. They just wanted to be there with us and do life. And mm -hmm. that's how you are a friend and how you are there for other people. Wow. You do life with them, yeah. which means you make sure that they know if they ever need to talk. You're there, but you allow them to choose when they're ready. Yeah. And you accept that they may just need you to be normal. Yeah. Just act be like life is normal. Your story shows the power of like normalcy and all of this chaos that you, cause nothing was normal in your experience. Yeah. All this, Oh, this sort of have like something normal. Mm -hmm. I can see how medicinal that was. Mm -hmm. And so being in such an intense environment as cooks is as sweet and as wonderful as they are. Like, uh, we were at, Panda Express the other day and it was like, do you want to donate $5? And Tim was like, yes, we will, because we know how much they helped you. And it's a great place, but it's intense. It's important that when you go through something like this, that you find normal, mm -hmm. whatever normal is going to be, because you are in um, fighter, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're in fight mode, you're in stress mode mm -hmm. a year or more after coming home. Like, you're in this reaction. Yes. Because she, when you brought her home finally, and I guess all the meanwhile, she was thriving and, and doing better and better. Mm -hmm. And then that moment of getting to come home, I'm sure was a very emotional day. Mm -hmm. They told us like Monday, I think it was. Yeah, it was Monday. They said, she's probably going to go home in a few, like, she's probably going to go home. Um, she was off the oxygen and stuff like, and so they said, we're going to, tomorrow we're going to do the car seat test where she has to be in the car seat for the amount of time that it takes for us to get home. Okay. So that's two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. I think they round, they went to three hours yeah, to be safe. Smart. Um, and so she has to be in there and because it's a different angle and all of that and their, their head can rest down. So she has to be able to do that without having any breathing problems. Oh. Um, and so they said, so we're going to do that test tomorrow. And so we, we're like, okay. So we start thinking about logistics. We're like, okay, we have all this stuff. We have to get it home. Oh yeah. And, huh. um, 
we have two cars. We don't want to go home in two cars because yeah. we had, you can't be out of the Ron McDonald house for more than 24 hours. Um, otherwise you lose your room. So we're like, okay, so we will take, we'll drive home, both drive home and then come back with just one car. Whew. But while we were gone, they did the car seat test. Okay. While we were gone and um, she passed her test. Wow. So the next day we were going to go, we were going to be mm-hmm. going home. Mm-hmm. So that night when we got back on Tuesday, so Tuesday night when we got back before she came home, we went, we're like, we are celebrating. It was a couple weeks before our anniversary. So we're like, we're going to celebrate. She's coming home. So we don't know when we're going to do an anniversary mm-hmm. thing. So mm-hmm. we're going to, we're just going to do this. Mm-hmm. And so we did. We went out, we had the nicest dinner we'd had like in years, probably. Oh, I mean, it was awesome. like the most expensive, like, yeah, it was you're like whatever. but we just had fun Worth and it. it was the best experience. We had the best oh, waitress and awesome. she, and so it was just, we had fun mm-hmm. and just laughed and smiled. And then we went back and the next day, we um got up and went and packed up her room and then took her back to the ronald mcdonald house packed up our room and drove home we both looked around like is somebody gonna stop us i know right we have a baby (laughs) we have this delicate baby (laughs) she's never left this building (laughs) that's great yeah (laughs) I could see how I'd be like, are we in trouble? Yeah, like, what is, what is happening? Oh, my gosh. I remember, like, I feel like I was more anxious then than when she was in the NICU. Oh, how funny. She's exposed. We're, like, <laughs> we're in the room at the Ronald McDonald house, and I have got, I've got her on the bed. The girl can't roll. Like, she cannot roll over or anything. She can't. She just lays there. She doesn't move. <laughs> but I've got, like, everything around her on the bed. How funny. And so you, you get them home. I and, mean, again, you had such a great support with people taking mm-hmm. care of your pets during this mm-hmm. time in your house. And here you are. And yeah. then it was like, now we're starting. Now we're, we're, we're home. We're in it. Like, uh, wow. She has had some things that we still have had to work on. But as far as like big medical things, like she didn't come home with any equipment. Wow. Um, But she did have some developmental things. She qualified for ECI, um, which is a therapy Mm -hmm. through the state. Mm -hmm. Um, And so she qualified for that. um, And they go to you. Okay. So you don't have to take her in. Nice. Um, The hardest thing for me to hear after losing Elizabeth was at least you still have one because and that would be an immediate like comforting thought well at least you have the one that's what you would think you would yeah. think it would be comforting yeah. but it, yeah. it is actually the complete opposite because it negates the life that you lost mm. so what would be I'm in a situation where it's like oh, I'm so sorry that's it all that's it okay there has there there doesn't have to be there doesn't you don't have to say anything to comfort someone all you have to say is i'm sorry you don't even have to say like i understand because there are women even from my experiences other people who have lost babies that i've known since then I would never say to them, I understand what you're going through. Mm -hmm. I have lost a baby. I have. Its situation is completely different than anyone I've ever known. Yeah. And so, and my way of dealing with it and experiencing it is different than Josh's way of experiencing Mm -hmm. it and dealing Mm -hmm. with it. And everyone's experience with that type of loss is different. Mm-hmm. So you don't even have to, don't even say. You don't even have to go You just understand. Just say, I'm sorry. And if you want to be a helpful, if that's your goal is to be helpful, ask, what can I do? And be willing to do whatever it is. 
if they say, I just, I, I don't know. Just say, give them some suggestions. Do you need food? Do you need somebody to clean your clothes? Do your dishes, Long, okay. clean your house, mm-hmm. whatever. Do you need someone to sit with you and watch TV with you? And that's it. And not say anything the whole time. Like, mm-hmm. do you need someone to feed your dogs while you're stuck in a different city for two months? Like, yeah. do you? So in a way, like, think of a list of practical yes. daily human things. The yes. lawn, the dogs, your laundry, your dishes. Um, just those practical mm-hmm. things more than anything to have support and normalcy and just the whole journey of taking care of you, but the situation, but Mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and the grief and all of it. And so, wow. Um, (laughs) do you think you finally, finally cut your breath at this point? Um, Oh, it's always new. Something's always new. They're always growing, always developing. Yeah. Always changing. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Normalcy is a blessing that um, I tend to take for granted. But boy, do I remember it when I'm going through a chaotic time or a lot of grief. Just to have that little taste of normal can be so grounding and so healing. And to know that you can offer that to someone who's going through something difficult and how much that will mean to them. It's, it's helpful to be reminded of this because, again, there's so many times when we face a grieving person and it's like, oh, we lock up. Is what I say going to be enough? Is it going to offend them even worse? <laughs> or um, am I just going to be in the way? Like, how do I help? Ah, you know. So today was such an insightful episode and I hope you found it as, as helpful as I did. So thank you, Becca, for sharing your story with us and for everyone who watched and listened. With that said, we will see you next time. Thank you so much for listening. Join us on Instagram at SWUT Podcast. That's S-W-U-T-P-O-D-C-A-S-T for further conversations, insights, and behind-the-scenes content from today's episode. And... For the complete viewing experience, tune into Shall We Unpack This on YouTube. We'll see you next week.